Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188. Welcome to Gardening with Burke Nursery, the show where we help you grow your garden, increase the curb appeal of your yard, and share information on all plants. I'm your host, Misty Kacheris, the horticulturalist at Burke Nursery and Garden Center. Everyone wants butterfly gardens, and that makes a lot of sense. I love watching the various butterflies flit through my garden, creating a dance of beauty and as you research creating a garden for your yard, you'll read about sun gardens that attract all sorts of butterflies. Well, butterflies need more than sun gardens. They also need shade. So, for those of you who have a lot of shade in your yard, this show is for you. Let's talk about butterfly gardens for the shade. It's true that butterflies need the sun, Many of your nectar flowers, which adult butterflies need, are full sun plants. Because butterflies are cold-blooded, they need the warmth of the sun to flex their muscles and fly. And when young butterflies emerge from their chrysalis, they need the sun to dry off their wings before they can fly. Yet, as one of the daughters of a friend of mine asked me, almost in despair, what if I don't have a lot of sun in my yard? My answer? Shade gardens are just as important to butterflies as sun gardens. Shade gardens provide the perfect nursery for your butterflies. This is where you can grow host plants. This is where you provide protection. And even some of these shade plants can provide the nectar that your butterflies need. So, what are host plants. Host plants are the plants that the butterfly uses when she lays her eggs and then the butterfly goes through its various stages. And several years ago, I was really blessed to find the larva stage of the butterfly, the black swallowtail butterfly in my yard. And then I was able to bring that in and I got myself a little butterfly nesting uh, cage. And I was able to raise some black swallowtail butterflies. So what I was also able to do was to get some pictures. And I think that these pictures are very important. This way, when you see that black swallowtail larva, then you know how to recognize it, you don't think it's a bad insect, and you don't go and kill it. Instead, you find ways to bring it to its host plant. So the stages, as I mentioned, are larva, which oftentimes is the cat, which is also the caterpillar stage. And so this first picture is what we call the first instar of a parsley worm. Yes, a parsley worm is what we call the larva of the black swallowtail. And this is actually was on one of my parsley plants, which is a host plant for the black swallowtail. And if you take a look at the parsley, and here is a little bit of parsley to show you, then what you'll notice is that the parsley leaves aren't that large, and in the picture, this larva is only half the size, so you're looking basically at an insect that's three quarters of an inch to an inch. It's black, it has yellow bumps on it and spines on it. And then when I first saw it, I thought, what is this white in the center? It looked like somebody had spilled some white paint on it. But actually, that is one of the ways that the swallowtail will actually protect itself. So as I mentioned, if you look 
at the first instar of the parsley worm, you'll see what looks like somebody took white paint and just spilled it. Some people call it a saddle. Well, this parsley worm, this first instar, goes to another area, and I, I do not have a picture of the second instar, but where it actually loses that white and it loses the spine and it just becomes black with orange dots. And then look at the next picture. This next picture is the actual parsley worm that a lot of people know and see in their yard. And again, it was on the parsley. Now this, and there's two parsley worms here. And these parsley worms will actually eat the entire parsley within 24 to 48 hours. So if you want to put parsley in your shade butterfly garden, then you may decide that you want to put it in a location that's a little further back because it will grow back. So the roots are still active. So even though it may eat the whole plant, it still will grow back. And also the other is that fennel, is another host plant to the parsley worm. And then the other, and my dill was doing so well, so I, and it was in a huge pot, too heavy, so I couldn't bring it in. But this is dill. And if you notice, dill and fennel look very, very similar. The difference is fennel has an anise taste and you can eat the fronds as well as eventually the entire plant. And then dill is more your mild, your herb. So these are culinary herbs as well. And then that's when I decided, hmm, birds also like parsley worms and I want to save these parsley worms. So I brought them in and I put them in with the parsley in my little birthing cage. In addition, what I did was that I put twigs in there because one of the things that the parsley worm will go to is the pupae stage and then it'll build the chrysalis around it. And in this picture, this first picture, there already is a chrysalis. And I loved it. I brought the neighborhood kids in so they could see it. But you may not realize if you look at the branch and look to the left of the branch, there's a little nub. So that's why I have the same picture, but I circled where the chrysalis is so you can see nature is amazing. And it's amazing because walking by a tree, you wouldn't even notice that the chrysalis is there. And in about 10 to 14 days, voila, there is my black swallowtail butterfly ready to be set off into the world. And I just had to wait until the next morning because I had five of them born and they all seem to be born at 11 o'clock at night, midnight. And you don't want to release them to the wild on a rainy day or a night because they need the sun to warm their wings, dry off their wings so they can fly. So there you have it. If you're going to create a shade garden that attracts your black swallowtails, make sure you either have your parsley as a host plant or your fennel or your dill as a host plant. Now the next picture is that of a buckeye butterfly. And buckeye butterflies there are a lot of them, but people don't see them that often. And the reason they don't see them that often is that they're what we call solitary. They kind of like to be alone. They like to be left alone. But they are just amazing butterflies with, with those eyes. I could almost do a whole show just on butterflies in general. But today we're focusing on developing your shade garden. So what are the host plants? for your buckeye butterfly? Well, the first host plant is the foxglove. The foxglove must have afternoon shade. So it definitely is a plant that works in your shade garden. And 
not only do butterflies like it, but other insects like it as well because the flower is tubular. And so with a tubular flower, then the insects can get in there. Bees love it. I do tell people, if you're going to buy a foxglove, make sure you check the flowers. I almost brought four bumblebees home with me because they just went right into the tube and were just having a wonderful time. Now, there are a couple drawbacks to the foxglove that are very important for you to realize. And one is that it's extremely poisonous. It is also known as digitalis. And that is, the foxglove is where the medication digitalis comes from. So it can injure you if uh, eaten. So if you have children that do a lot of eating, just be cautious. I don't know. I love the foxglove because it's a host plant to the buckeye, but I always stress the caution. The other, it's a biannual. And what that means is that the first year you get what we call the rosettes. That's the flowers at the base. And then the second year, the flowers come up and afterwards you end up with seed pods. And then you can cut off some of those seed pods because if you leave them all, believe it or not, this really self sows a lot. My recommendation is cut off a lot of the seed pods, leave a few so that you can have a few more foxgloves in your garden. But if you want the foxgloves to take over, then leave them all. That, in honesty, I don't recommend that. The next plant that is a host plant to the buckeye is also a host plant to your Marnock butterfly. And that is the swamp, and this is the swamp milkweed. The one thing when it comes to your shade butterfly gardens that I've noticed with most of the plants is that most of them like to get five feet, three to five feet tall. And this definitely likes to get that height. It loves the shade. It also is what I call a bog plant. That's why it's called the swamp milkweed. I don't want you to confuse this with another milkweed that is just wonderful. And this is also known as butterfly weed. So this is Eseclibus, oh gosh, I never pronounced that right. Esca, forget it. This is the incarnata version. This is the tuberosa version. Your tuberosa version, your butterfly weed, unfortunately does not like shade gardens. So if you're looking to develop a shade garden, make sure you get the swamp milkweed. The butterfly weed is also a host plant for your monarch butterflies, but it needs full sun to flower. Meanwhile, the swamp milkweed, it'll get similar flowers, that tend to be yellow versus the orange. So it'll get similar flowers, but that likes the shade, this does not. And I wanted to show you the difference. So we've talked about host plants and I'd like to introduce you to a few nectar plants that you can put in your shade garden that will be appreciated by butterflies, bees, and in some cases, even hummingbirds. There are actually a lot more nectar plants than people realize that can work in your shade garden. I'm only going to have time to go through a few of them, but one of my favorites is the astilbe. And the other thing that I want to talk about is when you're creating a garden, whether it's a shade garden, whether it's a sun garden, you really might want to think about the timing of the flower. So the astilbe flowers in spring, and that brings a lot of interest, and it brings your early pollinators to the, to the forefront, so to speak. And they may not always be butterflies. They may sometimes be sphinx moths, or they may be, obviously, they'll definitely be your bees. But that lets everyone know, hey, my shade garden is open for business. Now, the astilbe 
as far as flowering time, that's spring. Depending on the height, well, some astilbes are dwarf, meaning that they grow only about a foot or so. Other astilbes, again, as I mentioned earlier in this show, it seems a lot of the shade plants get three to five feet tall. So there are some astilbes that get three to five feet tall. The astilbe is also sometimes known as the false spirea. And the flowers, I just love this magenta flower, almost, almost purple, more than magenta, it's really purple. Or in some cases, some landscapers will actually call this kind of purple color more a blue. Then you also have white flowers, if you prefer white. You have red flowers, if you prefer red. Or you have pink, a pastel pink. And for years, the pastel pink was actually the favorite. But now, maybe it's me. I, I just seem to get a lot of purple in my yard. And in this particular cultivar of the astilbe, these are actually, the flower heads, are actually a lot thicker. They almost look like velvet. In some other cases, sometimes the flower heads will not be quite as tight as these are. In those cases, you'll get it even airier. With this astilbe, it's almost as if it's more structured, which is a little unusual in an astilbe. The next thing is think moving from spring to moving to late spring to early summer. And I couldn't bring the entire plant with me, but I did happen to bring a sample of the plant. And this flower is known as a bee bomb. And it's true, between the astilbe and the foxglove and now the bee bomb, I almost couldn't get into my car. I mean, the bees literally were following me, which is great. It would have been nice if a couple butterflies had followed, but they weren't quite around. So the bee bomb tends to be more your purple color. Sometimes I see it with a little red hue. And the bee bomb, this particular cultivar, actually does get two to three feet tall. And this will also work in full sun. So this is both for a shade garden, partial shade garden, and a full sun. Now granted, it won't flower quite as profusely in the shade, but it will still flower. It'll still do its trick. It'll still bring you a lot of butterflies. It'll still bring a lot of other pollinators to your garden. The next plant this next plant that I'm going to show you is actually one of my favorite plants. And this next plant is called the turtle head. And the turtle head actually blossoms from late spring to summer. Uh, let's see. It is so huge. This is actually a small turtle head that it's kind of in the way of who I am. So we'll move it back here and I'll move over here a little bit. So because it flowers in the summer months through fall, I actually have a picture of what the flower looks like. And if you were to be able to see the picture, the, the flowers are pink. There are some white ones, but again, I'm finding myself doing a pink, purple, blue kind of theme without even meaning to. So of course I love the pink ones. And what I do every spring is I will cut back the turtle head flower to about, oh, four or five inches. And the turtle head flower in my yard right now is already two feet tall by two feet wide. And I had it cut back in the beginning of April. So in, within two months, it has grown that far. As a matter of fact, it was cut back so much that I asked my friends who actually helped me with my garden whether or not they accidentally pulled them out. They didn't. And the other thing that if you have a rain garden, then you really want to consider the turtle head. 
It works in sun, so if it's a rain sun garden, you can use it there. It prefers the shade because it is what we call a bog plant. And just like the swamp milkweed, which also prefers to have a lot of moisture around it, the astilbe that I showed you also prefers a lot of moisture. So these are also plants that if you have a rain garden, consider that. And what is a rain garden? Well, that's a garden where you end up having rain puddling in that area, and then it dries out. So it goes from too much water to drought. And your bog plants, they like wet feet, and they don't mind drying out either. So consider the turtle head, like I said, not only for your uh, shade butterfly garden, but also consider it for your bog, for your uh, rain garden. And hummingbirds love it. They just love this plant. And then the final one that I have time to show you today is a bit lower. So we have this here, and this is known as a yarrow. And one of the things that I do tell kids when I'm talking to them about developing butterfly gardens is that butterflies do like flowers that are smooth on top because it's easier for them to land. Now, they'll go with tubular flowers as well, but they do like to have this type of flower to land on. When you look at the yarrow, what you'll find is that if you look at the tag, it'll say full sun. And it's true, it is happier in full sun. It flowers more profusely in full sun. But the yarrow will also work in shade. The yarrow, uh, most of them get about two to three feet tall. There is one caveat, though, to the yarrow. And it can become a little invasive. That's one, one thing about it. The other thing, though, sometimes this has happened to me, maybe it's happened to you. You go to the garden, it's gone in a year or two. Then two or three years later, it pops back up, but it's popped up in a different part of your garden. I've had that happen with lavender. I've had that happen with yarrow. I've had that happen with some of my sage. So it kind of dies back for whatever reason, doesn't really like that area anymore, but the roots have not died. So it's still growing underground and the roots keep traveling underground until they pop up in a new area that they like better. And like the turtle head, it is also a summer to fall bloomer. So just by planting these in your garden, then you will find that you have that interest throughout. And don't forget the other host plants that I talked about. Don't forget about putting in your herbs, the parsley, the fennel, the dill. Don't forget about the foxglove to see whether or not that's something you may want to consider. Definitely do not forget about that milk swamp wheat. That's, uh, that's I'm sorry, that swamp milkweed. That really is something that your butterflies need. Now, the other thing, when I was talking to my friend's daughter, I said, we also want to put in some garden art. She kind of looked at me and went, garden art? What's garden art? Well, butterflies like to do what is known as puddling. And so you want to create a puddling garden, not puddling garden, but you want to create a puddling space for them. And the puddling space, you would actually put in that area of your garden where you have the most sun. And so to create a puddling station, what I do is I take a tray, this is a pot tray, and I fill the pot tray with sand. And this is very coarse sand. I'm sorry, not very coarse, it's actually very smooth sand. And then 
I'm not doing it on the show today, but what I would do is before I totally did the last step in creating my puddling station, is I'd add a little of the soil from the garden into this, mix it in. Then what I would do is I'd take and pour a little bit of water in here because I want this to be moist. Why is this important? This is how the butterflies get their nutrients, their mineral, trace mineral nutrients that they need to grow. So they puddle, they, they all just go online and, and, you know, type in butterflies puddling and you'll be amazed. I mean, it's just amazing. They will land and be in this tray. And in some cases, there are several of them. I've seen some of the tiger swallowtails. Those are the ones that are yellow instead of the black. And I've seen like six or seven of them that are all near each other. And then finally, one more thing is make sure that you have some flat rocks. And the flat rocks are very important to have in your garden because the butterflies need a place to rest. Whether you have a sun or shade garden, you can still create an environment that attracts more butterflies and provides them with a safe haven. I'm your host, Misty Kacharis, and if you have any plant or gardening questions, contact me at misty at You know, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me here at Gardening with Burke Nursery, and I'm looking forward to helping you grow your garden. Funding for this program is made possible by Burke Nursery and Garden Center in Burke, Virginia. You'll find trees and shrubs, perennials and annuals, water garden supplies, house plants, and bird and gardening supplies. Burke Nursery also provides landscape, plant diagnostic, and installation services, and much more. For more information, you can check out their website or call 703-323-1188.